Hello, Irish fans. Not a great Saturday, Mike, for Irish Nation. Notre Dame falls to Cincinnati, 24 to 13, ending Notre, Notre Dame's 26 game home winning streak. Uh, you know, let's get right to it, Mike. I think the, the, the question I'm seeing the most is what took so long to replace Jack Cohn? Well, Greg. Welcome to the post game show. I'm I'm a I'm a veteran of the post game show, and <laughs> and you just joined our staff literally yesterday, Greg Ladkey. So before we talk Notre Dame football, an introduction to the man, Greg Ladkey, uh, Notre Dame grad, and um, uh, he's going to be doing a, a lot of video stuff. So Greg, welcome. Glad you're with us. But yeah, um, thank you, dude, dude. Um, I, I I don't have a lot of positive talking points today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a glass half full guy. Um, I like Jack Cohn as a quarterback less today than previously, but um, dude, yeah, he he's just not the guy for this football team. I've made the point of maybe he would have been – actually, I can't say maybe because I did say this. He would have been a better quarterback – this is what I previously said. If you put them on last year's team and you put Ian Book on this year's team, they're better teams both years. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like Ian Book is better for this year's team. But now I'm looking at last year's being like, yeah, I don't know if that would be the case now. Um, the, the more I've seen of Jack Cohn, the less confident I am in, in him as a football player. I still think he's good. He's just not the guy for this team. And my biggest kind of thought right now, Greg, is – is this loss on the coaching staff? Should they have played Drew Pine from the beginning? And if they did, this this might be a win we're talking about here. Yeah, you know, I, I think it was clear very early on and, that Cincinnati probably has the best defensive front Notre Dame played this year. They were going to put pressure. We know that there was this kind of ticking time bomb of Jack Cohn's lack of mobility and, and Notre Dame's vulnerability on their offensive line and that this was going to cause a disruption at some point. And it did today. You know, Drew Pine clearly has a little bit more pop in his footwork, the ability to get out of the pocket. I think he's actually a stronger thrower of the football, too. Um, so it's a tough call as a coach. But I, I thought at the end of the first half when Notre Dame got the ball at midfield, with about two minutes left, that was the time to go to Pine because they had no momentum at that point. They were down 17 to nothing. If you, if, you, if you put him in there and just get some sort of points, I think you might have a little bit of a different game. It's also worth mentioning, though, Desmond Ritter, he was throwing punches the whole game. I mean, counter-punching big time. Big time plays on second down long, third down long. So maybe whoever Notre Dame has in, Desmond Ritter has the answer on the flip side. So Ritter was 19-32, 297, two touchdowns, completion percentage 59%. Like, you know, he's, he's going to be an NFL draft pick. Like, he is a good quarterback. But to me, you know, is he some world beater as a quarterback? Eh, you know, like, I, I just look at this game and it just seems so much wasted opportunities. Like, Notre Dame was like, all right, let's just start at halftime. Look at the score by quarter. Scoreless at the end of the first quarter. Cincinnati dropped 17 in the second. Notre Dame zero. And then, you know, Notre Dame outscored Cincinnati 13 to seven. It's like, man, if that game would have gone on, you know, if there was a fifth quarter, um, you know, I, you know, does Notre Dame win that football game? Like you mentioned that Cincinnati had the best front, that uh, defensive front that Notre Dame's seen all season. But somehow Notre Dame seemed to block the best it had all season. You look at um, sack adjusted rushing yards, 99. Um, Cone, or the Notre Dame quarterbacks were only sacked, I believe, twice. Mm -hmm. That's um, correct. So, you know, it just was uh, the turnovers, Greg. That's a huge thing, right? The, the Tyree fumble, the two picks. Notre Dame... Um, you, you remember the, the Florida State opening drive? Notre Dame marches right down the field and scores. I believe either Toledo or Purdue is the same. Like they, they've cone against Wisconsin that first drive, just they would go five wide and march right down the field. Um, this game was the same march right down the field, and then Cone's dumb interception where, um, you know, he tried to just do too much. Um, you know, was not a good decision trying to throw that ball into harm's way. I don't know if he's trying to throw it away or still try to make a play, but. It was not a good decision, 
that was huge um, mm-hmm. for, for Notre Dame to not get points on that drive. Um, so losing the turnover battle like that, it certainly stung. Yeah, I mean, here's the, I, I, I'm a little higher on Desmond Ritter's performance than you were. I mean, I, I know okay. he missed – he, he missed some throws to the outside, especially in the first half. Maybe he was a little excited, but he was able to attack the middle of the field and, again, did it on second and long and third and long. There were, there were multiple occasions in that second half where Notre Dame's defense was in a, was in a very favorable down a distance, and it was Ritter that got it done. And, and you know, it's, it's, I'm always looking for a positive spin but also kind of a broader view of Notre Dame football or a long-term right. view. And, and the thing that's really frustrating to me about Desmond Ritter's performance is that if you, if you make the things that Notre Dame must have to win a national championship, their quarterback needs to be the best player on the field. Their quarterback needs to be a first-round draft pick, Heisman Trophy finalist type of player. I'm talking about Notre Dame. So it's frustrating when a group of five program, and I know Cincinnati's darn good, but yeah. it's frustrating when they're the one that has the quarterback that's the best player on the field inside Notre Dame Stadium. We, we talk about this all the time, truck or trailer. You know, mm-hmm. um, that, that's what, it's kind of one of my favorite things is you look at a football player. Is he a truck? Is he pulling other guys along because he's such a good football player? Or is he a trailer where he needs a truck to, um, you know, pull him along? And you mm-hmm. can look at truck or trailer, whether it's a position group, um, p- specific player, whatever it is, side of the ball. You know, right now, I think you can make an argument that Drew Pine is a truck for yeah. this offense, for what it is right now. Jack Cohn is not. He uh-huh. he's a trailer. Um, I completely agree with you. That's a, it's the same conversation we had last year, Greg, about Ian Book. Like, darn good college quarterback. You know, most wins uh, as a Notre Dame quarterback uh, in school history. Uh-huh. Um, but with Notre Dame not having elite weapons all around you, you need that quarterback to elevate the play of those other football players. Ian Book didn't do that. Um, in my opinion, for as good as he was, um, you know, in in terms of beating an Alabama, I should say being an Alabama or Clemson, you know, that, that kind of football team, um, especially when you do look at Alabama, Mac Jones is a, is a really good quarterback. I think he's going to be very good in the NFL, but you look at the the pieces around him, it's very easy to be successful when you have that around you. Um, so for Notre Dame, not to have just elite dudes all over the field, like that Kevin Austin drop, I'm sure we'll get into and, Mm -hmm. um, the ramifications of that, Greg, I mean, Devonta Smith makes that catch. Like, you know, if Notre Dame's again, my point being and is yours as well. If Notre Dame doesn't have an elite quarterback, they need to have elite weapons around them that, you know, and, and that's just not the case. And they don't have this year an elite offensive line. Um, and that's been the hallmark of their program for the last four to five years, it's, it's, it's what had really allowed them to play with Georgia um, and allowed them to get to the college football playoff twice in the last four years. And, and that's not there this year. They're, they've got not necessarily young, but in some cases inexperienced players playing at important positions. Kevin Austin just hasn't played a lot of football. You know, you wonder if he just hasn't gone through the repetition of concentrating on the ball, making sure you're looking it in. And, and so that you're ready to make that big play in the fourth quarter, which didn't happen. So, you know, I think that you kind of saw this coming with the offensive line performance. Uh, and, and, and to your point earlier, Mike, I mean, you, you get a little frustrated when, when the, the trigger isn't pulled on switching the quarterback because you've got to find a way to kind of mitigate um, the, the problems of the fact that you have a vulnerable offensive line. Yeah, that, that's what I was saying earlier. Like, yeah. if Pine starts, what what what's the result of this game? I mean, zero points. Was it all three turnovers in the first half as well? It was three in the first 18 minutes. So to compare <laughs> that, I think Tariko brought up right away, Mike Tariko, I should say, the play-by-play for NBC, um, you know, that Notre Dame only had five turnovers in the first four games. And then they come out and three turnovers in the first 18 minutes. And by the way, I mean, the other thing, just as a Notre Dame fan, this is this is the first egg they've laid uh, at home in a long time where you just said, like, I know they've had some wins where they kind of played poorly. I mean, Vanderbilt comes to mind, but and where they just lost and they just came out and played really poorly. They've been really good as a program jumping on teams at home. And it was just a different kind of game. And I, it's just an odd feeling for, uh, for Notre Dame fans to see that sort of performance inside the stadium. Yeah. 
yeah, obviously first loss in, in, in 26. I mean, they had a 26 game home streak and you lose to Cincinnati. I mean, so many storylines that were yeah. coming into this game as well, Greg, with, you know, Marcus Freeman, uh, Mike Mickens, Jeff Quinn, Brian Kelly, all being former Cincinnati coaches now in Notre Dame. Of course, Marcus Freeman just there last year, Mickens there a couple years ago. Michael Young, uh, Cincinnati receivers formerly at Notre Dame. Mike Denbrock, former mm. uh, Notre Dame offensive coordinator. I'm sure there's other little things in there that I'm, I'm forgetting about. There's, you know, the, the Bolton board talk during the week of Desmond Ritter saying the Notre Dame crowd's going to be silent, uh, you know, or, or quieted after not too long. And, yeah. um, you know, our Tyler Horka, who, you know, was in the press box was saying that there was, um, you know, let's go Bearcats chance or, or something to that effect breaking out during the game. Um, ton of red in the stands. Um, I mean, we've kind of touched on a few different talking points we have lined up here, Greg. I don't know which one you want to go to. Well, next. I, th I think you just queued up one that uh, is going to be a, a big topic during the week, which it, which is, you know, we don't know exact figures. We know Cincinnati was given, I think, 6,000 tickets before the game, right? And I think it was pretty clear. I mean, you can hear on the telecast that that they, they had more than 6,000 people there. Um you know, I don't know. I, I, in fact, I tried to pitch it to our board. Maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't have put it in the official game, game thread about, hey, why, why are you not going to games? Who here has has decided not to go to a game this year? That you want to go to? So, you know, it might be ticket prices. A lot. I know we had this discussion on our forum a couple weeks ago. It might be, you know, COVID and travel. Notre Dame has a national fan base, uh, and it's just. Maybe it's just too much of a pain in the rear end, along with ticket prices, to, to go to a game. But we don't have an exact figure on how many people from Cincinnati were at the game. We're Cincinnati Bearcat fans. But it's a little disappointing when you hear them on the opposite side of the field, near the student section, make a big play. And on the broadcast, you can hear loud and clear the Cincinnati fan reaction. Yeah. Mike Singer, Greg Ladke, we are live on YouTube talking here. Uh, Notre Dame football, 2014, 24-13 loss. Um Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up, um, drop super chats. We'll, we'll get to your questions right away. Otherwise, we will um, take all of your questions, uh, most of your questions at least, um, here in a bit. So, yeah, you mentioned the national fan base thing. Um, I mean, mm. coast to coast, international. Notre Dame's got fans everywhere. Cincinnati, if you're a Cincinnati fan, you you went to school there or you're from Cincinnati, right? And, and that drive is, is, is doable, um, mm -hmm. for a weekend so that that just has to be and that's their Super Bowl right playing Notre yeah. Dame so this yep. is Notre Dame's and this is kind of segueing into another point if you want to take it here Greg is this is Notre Dame's worst loss since when or how big of a worst loss and then you look at Cincinnati this is their biggest win of program history um yeah so it was their Super Bowl worst home loss um so I mean I you know I grew up watching Notre Dame uh it's let, let's throw out like the Willingham years and the Weiss, a couple of the Weiss years where they got just destroyed by teams because Notre Dame was a bad football team. But Lou Holtz had good football teams that had a habit of losing at home. Their two losses in 1990 to Stanford and Penn State, both at home. 91, you had that famous Tennessee comeback where they blow a big lead in the fourth. 92, they got just destroyed by kind of an average Stanford team. That 92 team, I think, was the most talented of the whole Holtz era. So it's kind of one of those feelings where maybe this Notre Dame team isn't as good as those teams, but they're 4-0, and you start thinking, well, if they win this game, now we can start talking about being undefeated. Now we can start talking about a playoff, and it's just, like, deflating. So I think in recent, in, in the recent last five, six, seven years, definitely by far the most disappointing home loss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's big recruits on campus this weekend. I'll, I'll be contacting – um, recruits and, and having articles uh, with the various reactions there up at blueandgold.com this weekend. And of course mm -hmm. the gold standard, which is my big scoop article um, to come out of the weekend. I'll, that'll be posted a Monday late morning or early afternoon. Um, Mike, how much do you think this loss effect? I get this question a lot from my, from my friends, a loss at home. How does that impact recruit visits? So it depends how you look at it. If you want to look at it in a micro recruitment, like w going specifically to recruitment to recruitment, we could be here for a, a while um, to kind of give my opinions. But from a macro level, not a ton. Because mm -hmm. if I'm, you know, ex coach who had a bad performance from my position group, I'm going to that recruit who was there and be like, man, that's why we need you. Yeah. You know, or if we, uh, you know, if I'm the Notre Dame coach, we blew that team out. My position group played great. It's like, hey, you know, come be a part of this. So you, if you're a good salesman as a recruiter, you can you can spin it either way. 
Um, so in my personal opinion, especially for those 2023 recruits who were there, which is the majority of, of, of big time targets for Notre Dame on campus, you know, so many of them are not making decisions anytime soon, Greg. So, you know, there, there there's plenty of time, much more football to be had. Yeah. Hey, I want to touch on another thing that uh, we had on the top of our list is, is the offensive line play. Mike, I know you, you were pointing out to me during the game that in the fourth quarter, they they seemed to get a combination that was that was working a bit, at least in terms of pass protection. Joel at left tackle. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Singer, by the way, is long, Ben. <laughs> You're like, I, I don't know if you did a, a top 20 or a top players for last year's recruiting class rank by yourself, but I know you would have had Joel top two or three in the class. But he was yeah. at left tackle, Carell at left guard, Patterson at center, Christophic at right guard, and Lug at right tackle. Maybe that translates into next week at Virginia Tech because, it, you know, with a night game and probably silent counts, it's, they, they, they need something. So, Greg, it kind of seems like halftime was the turning point of this season to say, all right, we've been kind of winning by the skin of our teeth, right? Mm. Barely got by Florida State, who's having a terrible season. Barely get by Toledo. You, they won against Purdue by 14, but that was a one-score game midway through the fourth. They beat Wisconsin by 28, but that was 13-10 early in the fourth before, you know, defense and special teams won it for you. So you have a 4-0 team who has so many holes, um, and it really could be 1-3, right? So I think at halftime, it was kind of like, all right, we're going to we're, – we're, we have to change things up. We have to give this offense a spark. And it's more on the offense. I think the defense has been very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't the, think at least defense was great today, though. Yeah, it, it got it Bias done. Right. You know, I, I, you know, there were stretches. I think, you know, the the touchdown when Cincinnati went up 17-0, um, you know, that was certainly not a good one. Five plays, 80-yard drives, and then the last one was a backbreaker. But for the most part, I think the Notre Dame offense – or excuse me, the Notre Dame defense did enough to win. But going back yeah. to what I was yeah. saying, oh, yeah. um, Greg, was – you know, it, it's it's like, all right, it's time to make changes. Like, what can we do? Drew Pine at quarterback. And then you see Joe Alt, um, hashtag Joe Alt fan club, um, yeah. which I'm the, I've been the president of. Um, you put him at left tackle. I don't know if Carmody went down or what the situation was with him. Of course, uh, Baker was not available for the game. Um, but you put Kristoff again for Kane Madden. Um, Madden was, you know, guy who came in as an All-American from Marshall and you know, a lot of people have not been excited about his play this season. So, you know, he comes out. I think that five might be a little bit better. I know folks in the YouTube chat are very <laughs> frustrated with the offensive line. I do feel a little bit of optimism, Greg, and maybe it's misplaced that that five, you know, could be a little bit better. Um, you know, I'm not going to even say definitely better. I think you could see a significant improvement. Greg, you mentioned earlier, this was the the toughest defensive front. You think Notre Dame's face and they had their best rushing day of the season, 84 yards. uh, And then uh, when you have sack adjusted rushing yards, 99. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I think you you still see though, individual issues. I mean, Carell's getting pushed back in the backfield a lot still. Yeah. You know, I mean, Joe Hall is just a true freshman. Um, it's, but it seems if I had to guess, like they're, they're going to, they, they, they still need the cohesion. Right. And so at some point I'm, I'm glad they tinkered with it and, and there seemed to be some results, but now you're going to Virginia tech with let's presume Drew Pine is going to start. Okay. And he is going to be a first time starter. He's going to be going out to enter Sandman nighttime game with an offensive line that is, you know, if, if they're going with the lineup they had in the second half, it's going to be a new lineup. So it's going to be a really interesting week, a really important week of practice for, for Notre Dame to be productive because now, now the goal is 11-1, and one, right? Trying to get to a January Bowl, end the season of momentum for a program that looks like they could be pretty darn good the next two years. Yeah. Oh, man. As far as Pine next year, I, I don't want to go on too long of a kind of a tangent here, Greg, but in covering the kids' recruitment, um, you know, he, he was my favorite recruit to cover in the 2020 class. Saw him a couple times in person, was just really impressed with them. You know, he's not the biggest guy, doesn't have the strongest mm-hmm. arm, but, you know, this is a kid who got his first offer from Alabama. Yeah. Or, or excuse me, he, that, that, that might not be great. I know he had offers from Alabama and then Jimbo Fisher in Florida State when the kid was just in eighth grade. 
Um, so a lot of people doubted him early on. Like, he's not that good. He shouldn't be getting all these offers. The kid's gone through a lot um, with criticism for years now. I mean, he was, as an eighth grader, crowned the next big thing by some and then, you know, by others. You know, he's, he shouldn't even be a Division One quarterback. I think my point here is I think this kid's got the moxie and the poise that I think against Virginia Tech, um, I think that he is going to be able to handle that environment. Um, that's just one man's opinion. Yeah, I mean, Drew Pine actually probably holds the record for the most rivals camps attended uh, of anyone we've ever had. He started coming to them in the eighth grade, and, and, and he was a mature, really bright kid when, when he was that age. I mean, so what you see and what you've heard on the telecast about him being a super likable guy – being responsible during the week in practice, paying attention is is of no surprise. But but next week is going to be the real deal. I mean, we don't know a whole lot about Virginia Tech. They had that first win against North Carolina. They're in a bye week, so it's kind of like the Cincinnati situation this week, where you don't know because they've had a couple inferior, they've had an inferior opponent in a bye week. So, but it's gonna, we do know it's going to be tough. You know, I mean, that's just, we'll see. Um, but man. It would have been nice to be five and zero and going into that with the potential to get into your bye week, and then I think you know that that twelve and zero talk starts to get pretty legitimate. So, dude, it. I mean, th- this could very well be a. So what? This is what this, that was game five. Yeah, this could be a, a, a two and three team. Like mm-hmm. it, it's. I think Notre Dame is is kind of lucky to be at four and one right now. Like this is just not a great Notre Dame football yeah. team. Like. I, if you look at the 2019 team, which I think went 11 and two after the camping world bowl win against Iowa state. Like I think that team is significantly better yeah. than this Notre Dame football team. Um, there's just a lot of holes uh, offensively right now. It, it's just D I, I mean, yeah, it wasn't the defense's best game, Greg, but I still think there's, you know, I, I think they did enough. To, I mean, 24 points. Yeah, and they gave up 10 and, off turn. And the and offense did not help. That that Tyree fumble, you know, that set up Cincinnati in the red zone. Yeah, and Cincinnati's first 10 points and, and were off of, I think, 20 yards of total offense because they, 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 they got them off of turnovers. So, I mean, Notre Dame's defense certainly played well enough to win. I base it a little bit on, you know, their collective tackles from their linebacking core was pretty low. Uh, when you see defensive backs kind of creep up there in total tackles, and I'll, I'll bring up the stat page, but... You know, you didn't have a linebacker with eight or nine total tackles or even double digits. You have DJ Brown up there, Clarence Lewis with with uh, in, in the top five in tackles. You know, that to me is just a sign that I think, especially in this defense, that that you need your linebackers firing off on all cylinders. And they just looked to me a, a step slow today. I have all the confidence in the world that they're good players. It just wasn't to me their day today. Yeah, yeah. JD Bertrand. I had a, a high school coach I'm close with you know, told me that, you know, he's just really struggling today. And yeah, I mean, yeah, TFLs are, that's low for Notre Dame. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the defense, yeah, three, the three, yeah. off one sack. And sorry, I didn't launch the defensive stats page there, but yeah, my point here, you can see, I mean, just, you know, just not, I think just not enough from the linebackers today. They needed, they needed to be a little bit more, make more tackles closer to the line of scrimmage than they did. You know, the the one unit that I think has shown up pretty much every game, Greg, is, is the defensive line. Like, I yeah. think they had a really good performance. Foskey with the impact play, the sack fumble, recovered by Drew White to set Notre Dame up for a score. Thought that was good, but um, when I, I thought the corners in, in the secondary overall looked good early in the game. Um, I think that, you know, that was such a position where – uh, an overall unit that we would look at in the past years and say, man, it's such a, a weakness. Notre Dame needs to improve out on the perimeter. I think that it's different now. I think that that group can at least hold its own um, against really good competition, uh, which I would put Cincinnati in that category. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't have any issues with the defense after this game. Were they perfect? No, they were not perfect. Um, they didn't play their best game. I thought last week was that, um, but you know, it, it just really, again, goes back to the offensive line without beating a dead horse, Greg. Mike, as you know, we do take super chats. Um, we uh, are for sale in terms of you want to drop one in, in the comments uh, via YouTube. Uh, you can drop one in there and we'll try to get to your question. Uh, and, and uh, you know, let's let's start the Q&A part of the show. I, I, one 
question I want to address right off the bat because he asked it twice, probably by accident, was from Wayne Smith. He said, is Rocco Spindler still in South Bend? I think by this point, and Michael, let me let, let me let you answer that first. I, I have an answer for that as well. Yes, he is. Um, there there hasn't been any reports on uh, him not being uh, with the team. So yeah, yeah, that that's that's the quick answer. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by yours. Yeah, if if you haven't played yet for this offensive line, you're not good enough to play yet. That, that's that's my answer, especially if you're a guard, because the guard play has not been been up to a Notre Dame level or even an uh, a, 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 a average level for a power five program. So that would be uh, my, my question. We know we heard throughout camp that, that he's an exceptional talent. Um, you know, Notre Dame playing these freshmen, uh, Joe all uh, the newest one on the offensive line is going to pay dividends down the road. Uh, but you know, it, 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 man, it, it's, we knew this was coming or you can kind of predict this was coming, you know, I'm just, just in terms of having some inexperience on the offensive line. And, and uh, I know, I know it's, it's easy to try to say, try to mix and match personnel and wonder who's doing what, but I guess my one point would be again, like if you're a good enough, if you're a good offensive line, you're playing on this unit and then um, you can't tinker with it too much because you're going to a loud venue next week and, and you do need some cohesion. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, as the president of the Joe Alt fan club, as much as I think that young man's a baller, even I um, did not foresee him um, being needed as a freshman. Little, I mean, I didn't think he was going to see the field at all. Actually, yeah. when he was a recruit, he, uh, he had it told me that Notre Dame had talked to him about that six offensive line role as a tight end, something he did in high school. Mm. Um, but I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, I don't, I don't actually think it's going to happen. Let alone him. Potentially being a left tackle starter in Notre Dame's fourth, you know, if that might happen, right? Um, Notre Dame might have its fourth left tackle starter on week six. That's unheard of. Yeah, um, and you and you followed him throughout the process. I mean, one one of the things, one of the reasons why he's on the field is is tremendous just strength and weight gain during the off season. I think that there were signs that he's he's. He, I think he's a freak, actually. Yeah, I mean. Two years ago, at this point, he was about six six, two hundred thirty pounds. Now, you know, I made the joke every time you mentioned Joe Walt, he gains five pounds and grows an inch. You know, so now I think he's about six seven, six eight, three hundred pounds or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is. He's a freak. Yeah, um, and and still moves at that size and to grow that much in such a short amount of time, weight wise, and to not like tear up your knees or um, have it be bad weight. It's impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple other things I want, I want, I want to just touch on before we get to some more questions is, um, you know, the Kevin Austin drop and just some things yeah. like the missed kick. Uh, there was just a little bit of, what do you think? I mean, lack of focus. I mean, there was some penalties early on the turnovers Again, this is just one of those things we've gotten so used to good offensive line play, good play at inside Notre Dame Stadium. Notre Dame often being the clearly the smarter team on the field, and uh, and today just wasn't wasn't really that. So Austin drops that ball. Notre Dame is down seventeen seven early in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. He would have had at, at least at midfield um, if he would have just caught it and fell down. But I mean, heck, if he breaks a tackle, it's it's touchdown potentially. Um, that then you're looking at potentially 17-14. and then if that sack fumble happens and, and Notre Dame scores, I mean, you're, you're talking about a lead for Notre Dame. Um, that was huge. Like when that drop happened, mm-hmm. you and I were, were were texting and saying, you know, that we're going to talk about because that might be the turning point in the game. And yeah. So what do you think about Drew Pine next week at, at, at Virginia Tech? Again, we're making an assumption. I mean, unless Brian Kelly is, while we're on the air here in the presser, said he's going to start. But there, you know, you're, you're putting him in a situation where he'd be the name starter. You give another team a, a week to prepare. There's not necessarily a lot of film out there on him. Um, he's probably played a total of, of three quarters of football now. But it, it's going to be interesting. You know, a start being a starter is a different thing. Yeah, I don't think – I mean, Virginia Tech, they play today. No, they have a bye. They're, bye. they're like this. It's one Everyone of eight or nine Notre Dame opponents this year that have a bye before playing Notre Dame. 
Yeah, everyone's got to buy before they play Notre Dame. Yeah. Um, I don't think Virginia Tech is that is is going to be a world beater. That was Virginia Tech was kind of one of these um, going in the season a sexy upset pick. You know, if you're mm-hmm. going to look at one for Notre Dame, um, but I, I don't know. I, I like Notre Dame to win next week, um, but I also feel like if there was a fifth quarter in this game, I think Notre Dame wins the game. So that might yeah. just be misplaced optimism. But yeah, if Drew Pine's the guy and they get a little spark on the offensive line, team kind of rallies around Drew, the locker room stays intact, um, I I think they get a win next week. Mike, another question that uh, I know is is sometimes going to be a tough one to talk about, but I think it's going to be a topic again. Brent Byers asked on our comments, the O-line is clearly trash. That would be using a Mike Goolsby term. Uh, Who is that on? And then, you know, is is that on Coach Quinn? Dude, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. I, I I like I like Jeff Quinn as a recruiter. Mm-hmm. Um, you can hate me all you want in the comments section. I really don't care since I joined the Blue and Gold staff two and a half years ago. You know, I I thought Jeff Quinn has done a really nice job. Um, you know, Tosh Baker, Michael Carmody in that 2020 recruiting class. I think those guys are going to be future NFL guys. Again, hate me in the comments if you want. Don't care. I think one miss was not getting a third offensive lineman in that class. I think you're kind of seeing the ramifications of not ha- having having an extra body there. Um, and then 2021, look, Blake Fisher, you're starting left tackle before he goes down. Joe Walt, um, who again was a tight end two years ago, yeah. um, is ready to play. Um, you know, you, you made the point on Rocco earlier. I can't disagree with you, but you know, I still think that's going to be a good football player. And then, Oh, no um, doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, Caleb Johnson, you know, I think will be a solid right tackle someday. And then Pat Coogan, uh, a good interior player, as far as his coaching and his technique, you know, I'll let other people debate that. Um, but as far as recruiting goes, since I've been covering Notre Dame football recruiting, you know, I, I think it's, it, he's a, he's a good coach, but you know, who gets the blame? I think it goes around to everybody. I think uh, Quinn gets some blame. Uh, I think you have to give some blame to Reese and Brian Kelly, the actual players that get some blame, and the quarterback, you know, and mainly Jack Cohn. You know, he, he there's certainly been examples where um, he has held the ball too long. And as Tim Hyde talked about in our pregame show Friday, Mm-hmm. Um, there's been instances where there's just miscommunication up front. There was the against Wisconsin pine, um, was sacked and fumbled Wisconsin cut, recovered the ball. The defensive end just ran right in between Andrew Gustafson and Tosh Baker, um, the left guard and left tackle respectively. And, you know, we believe that that was on Christophic, um, mm-hmm. that there was just miscommunication there. Um, Baker had to slide out and pick up the edge, the, uh, the blitzing linebacker, Christoffic should have slid out and and picked up that, um, that, uh, the the defensive end, you know, so those things are going to be important, but, you know, we'll certainly dive into the film. We'll have Mike Goolsby, Mike, uh, excuse me, Mike Goolsby and Tim Hyde on, uh, in the upcoming week should have a show tomorrow with Mike Goolsby. So he's texting me as we record right now, Greg, he's pretty fired up. Yeah. And I I love listening to his stuff and and there's going to be a lot to break down and, and I'll be really curious to uh, hear what what Goolsby has to say about about the linebacker play because, I mean, he'll be critical about them sometimes when I when I think they play pretty well. I mean, yeah. and and uh, he, he's got a high level of expectation. So, um, you know, I, w- I want to touch upon a little bit more of the offensive line and and kind of the growing pains aspect of this because it, it's it's something that we're going to continue to talk a lot about. But I get excited about you know the future with, with think about Blake Fisher and Joel Alt as your tackles, you know, Zeke Corral last year, I thought played when he, when he played against Alabama at, at center, yeah, that, that seemed to work, you know, Rocco Rocco Spindler, the reports were super positive about him in, in, in camp. Um, you know, so, so I, I know fans want to fire coach, fire coach, and we see it on our boards. It's crazy, right? Everyone wants to fire Tommy Reese after a drive when they don't score that. And, yeah. and it's one of those things where it's like, you, if, if you do something like that, you got to make sure you don't rock the boat too much with what, what you're trying to get accomplished now. It's clearly a developmental unit at the time, at this time, but um, that, that's just going to, again, growing pains, and today was one of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we got a comment from Brent saying how many recruiting battles for elite recruits does Quinn win? Tell me one. Yeah. 
I mean, how much time do you want to spend? I mean, I would argue that Blake Fisher, who admitted publicly that he almost um, committed to Michigan, like Blake Fisher was a Michigan lean. Did you? I mean, I know a lot of people say, "Oh, it doesn't matter." Mike Singer could be the O line coach, and Blake Fisher would have committed to Notre Dame. Well, yeah. I mean, Fisher was leaning Michigan and has said it as much publicly. Um, so there's one. I don't know Rocco Spindler. Um, you know Notre Dame went into to you know Michigan's backyard and and landed mm-hmm. him. Um, they flipped Caleb Johnson from Auburn. Um, I, I mean Tosh Baker. I mean that they went into Arizona and beat out. I mean Baker was a top fifty recruit when when he committed to Notre Dame. He dropped late in the process for um, reasons that I, I, I kind of frustrate me. Don't want to get into, but <laughs> I, I would say Baker's elite recruit. So. I know supporting Jeff Quinn is probably not a popular opinion right now, and I'm trying to support Jeff Quinn, but I still think that the future of the Notre Dame offensive line is very good. Um, It is just right now the the talent is not there, Um, you know, to to be a truck like we talked about earlier. It's, It's just not there. Last year, that offensive line made a lot of that running game, and this year it's you know, not because of them. Um, we'll get to uh, Wayne Smith's question next, but the, I want to, to 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 throw a point to you. You know, Notre Dame's had success with transfers in the past, uh, but you know, right now they're 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 two kind of marquee transfers this year: Jack Cohn and Kane Madden at right guard. And um, Kane Madden need to be in there for for. I mean, it was completely necessary, right? The, otherwise, you're looking at starting a really young kid on the inside on an offensive line, but. It just uh, today was again one of those days that illustrated a little bit that that they didn't get everything they needed from those two, um, and and it, it result and not that's not the only reason why they lost. Obviously, there's a zillion reasons, but um, you know it's just it's just one of those things where you know you think the transfer portal portal is, is the perfect thing. You, they kind of get a little hyped up. I mean, Kane Madden had all these, you know accolades from pro football focus and all, all conference honors, all American honors, various places. And, and, and it's not, it's not happening. And to answer the question from Wayne, um, uh, I mean, he, he had a great game last week. Um, yeah, this week, the drop just looms large. Um, his stat line, um, was not great. One reception, 17 yards on two targets. And again, that drop, you know, was loomed large. Yeah. Good, uh, good observation here from Brandon. Uh, you know, special teams had a bad day. They had a fumble, Chris Tyree, Chris Tyree clearly started running before he caught the football and, you know, young guy. Right. And he just had a play that was one viral last week, big touchdown, changed the course of the game versus Wisconsin. He's probably all excited to do that again. Right. And just got a little ahead of himself. Yeah. Was that a touchdown? Did that result in a touchdown, his fumble? I can go look at the drives here, um, or excuse me, yeah. the play-by-play. Um, yeah, it's like his – Because uh, tur- there was two turnovers in a row that resulted in 10 points. Right. Um, and you can see here it was, it was just uh, – I'll, I'll, I'll pull up the sheet right now. Um, you know, it was, it was two drives that, like I said earlier, it was, it was only 20 yards of total offense. Um, so the – let's see where they started here. Yeah. Um, on the set, there's probably this one on the 17. So that was okay, the one that, that was all in the field goal. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I mean, 10 nothing. It goes back to the, 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 it feels like the defense maybe didn't play as well, but, but they still played well enough to win. I mean, this is college football. You're playing at home. You got to score. Uh, if, if you go into that game thinking, hey, Cincinnati's only going to score 24 points. And in fact, 10 of them are going to come off of a couple blunders, turnover blunders. You're probably taking that, you know, and you got to get yeah. the job done on offense. And, and it, it just certainly didn't happen. I, I guess you got you certainly got credit Cincinnati. You know, this is a Notre Dame show, so we don't want to throw too much credit around. But but they were as advertised on on each level. Their defensive line played well, linebackers played well, and they got some very very sticky DBs that that were able to, for the most part, shut down uh, Notre Dame's wide receivers. Yeah, no, I think Drew Brees' favorite football player on the field was that Sauce um, kid who we kept talking about all the time. Yeah. So well, we, we good. Yeah. No, he was. Yeah. Gardner is a very good football player. So you go at Virginia Tech next week, bye week, USC home, North mm. Carolina home. You know, I think that stretch of three games does not look as scary as it did before no. the season. 
but also Notre Dame is not as good as we thought before the season. So curious your your take, Greg, on you know these neck the next you know three games to round out the month of October after a loss. I mean the big the biggest thing to me is, is well let's just take them one at a time. I mean. Virginia Tech's on the road, you know, I mean, I think that's going to be a tough game. You know, you're going to go there. If it's loud, you're going to have a silent count thing. You're going to have the same dynamic you had at Florida state uh, where the offensive line, it's harder to get off the ball quickly when you're going silent count and you're already dealing with an offensive line. That's still looking for some cohesion. Um, So it's, I I think that that's got potential to be a a pretty tough thing. You know, I, I, you got you got to hope for what Notre Dame basically did in 2018 when they went down to uh, or went over to Blacksburg. They they get the ball on their first drive, march down the field and score. And you know I know that I was at the game as a fan, by the way, with a couple of college buddies. But uh, um, you know they they go down the field and score. They take the crowd out of the game. Virginia Tech comes back, and then you have some momentum change in plays. You know you, you had a fumble, uh, a scoop and score, and then the big the big Williams run in the third quarter. So. They're going to need that sort of thing because you're just going to need to be able to communicate up front on the offensive line. Then USC just seems to be like they're kind of in shambles, right? I mean, yeah. um, but they've got talent. It's not like they're not losing games because they're – I think they whooped up on Colorado today. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, they're not a middle-of-the-road Pac-12 team because they're a middle-of-the-road Pac-12 talent team. I mean, they, they really should be much closer to Oregon than they are to – you know, in Arizona state. Um, and then North Carolina to me, my only caution about North Carolina, they've been pretty bad on defense this year, but you know, we talk about units at Notre Dame, whether it's the offensive line improving maybe a little bit today and and you hope to see it. If they get improvement from their defense and they've got some personnel where they shouldn't be all that bad, their offense is still awesome. I mean, Sam Howell, yeah, Coffrey Brown and and Josh Downs at receiver and Chandler at running back. That's actually the game to me I think I'm most scared of. Now, if their really? defense doesn't improve, then they're gonna, I think they'll be in trouble. But that's a team I could see finishing pretty strong. Okay. So you think uh, I'd probably say 2-1 and one to finish the month oh, of October? Oh, 3-0. Oh, come on. <laughs> now, I, yeah, 2-1. I, I, yeah, and one. I mean, yeah. Because, I mean, it's funny, you know – we, you and I, I think, agreed, and, and uh, many of our colleagues and, and contemporaries in, in the industry all thought like nine and three, ten and two. Uh, it's got to come from somewhere, you know. Yeah. And that's just the feel of whether you look at the schedule or not. The type of Notre Dame team we're talking about this year is 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 that sort of level nine or ten wins. And I still think ten. I bet you they get through the year. I wouldn't rule out eleven and one. I love how they finished. If Drew Pine could stay healthy some signs on the offensive line, the fourth quarter that could get together. I love Notre Dame's defense. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a, this is a really important week of practice, right? I mean, yeah. you just got to kind of put this behind you and, and still salvage. If you go 11 and one and win a bowl game, that's a great year. Yeah. Yeah. I picked 11 and one. Um, so yeah. Oh, you did. Oh, about it. well, yeah, that, yeah. You'd be right. Tyler Horka picked nine and three, Patrick Engel, 10 and two on our staff. Um, yeah, so in terms of optimism moving forward, you know, if Drew Pine is the guy, which I've got no idea where, where Brian Kelly, where his head is at right now with that, um, but, you know, you get a spark from Pine, offensive line improvements, and you, you feel good about your running backs, the receiver position, you know, hopefully Joe Wilkins, um, you know, is, is okay. Mm. Um, you know, you like what you see from the true freshman Lorenzo Styles and Deion Colsey, um, but you need consistent performance from Kevin Austin. Goodness gracious. Braden Lindsay, I thought, showed up and had a good game. Four catches, 61 yards on um, on nine targets, though. So that was, you know, uh, completion percentage now, 44%. Yeah. Uh, hopefully Michael Mayer is healthy. So you look at some of these offensive weapons, it's good. It's just, you know, can Pine, you know, now be the guy? How how does he handle that? Which I talked mm-hmm. about earlier. I think he's got the moxie, but yeah, I think it's different being the guy and they're game planning against you versus you know kind of coming in and bringing a spark and a being a relief pitcher. So, um, yeah, but I, I think the biggest question is going to continue to be on the offensive line. Can they find much continuity and consistency there? Uh, we have. A question from Starling three is Reese the guy. I know uh, it's tough to talk coaches, but dude, I don't got anything for it. I, I, 
I, I, I don't like being play call guy. Like, yeah, neither do I, but I, I just don't like, Oh, like uh, called a flea flicker, you know, it, 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 that what a stupid call. Well, if it would have worked, then you would be saying, well, of course he called a flea flicker. That's what yeah. you do in that situation. You know, like I, I'm not play call guy. Um, you know, when you see Notre Dame continue to be great on those f- opening drives, that's that's coaching and preparation to me. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not you know, call out play calling guy. Uh, that, that's just not me, you know. Yeah, neither am I. The one thing that I thought was real curious was the first drive. I mean, go back to the first play. I mean, the biggest hole that offensive line has opened all year was that Kyron Williams 16 yard run right that off the bat. Beautiful. Quick hit and run plays. They go down the field and they don't get the score, you know, because of the the the, the turnover. But I thought they came out rocking. And then I thought there were a, a couple good at Cincinnati did a good job preparing for both quarterbacks. If you go back to the when Buckner won in. They were stunting into Buckner, which if you're a young quarterback, that's just like – it's like me producing the show, Mike, right? You, you're doing it for the first time. You don't remember every button you got to hit. Well, for right. Buckner, I just think he lost track of where the defense – where the linemen were stunning from. And so first play, he runs basically right into a stunt for one-yard loss. Reese, next play, he gets him outside. He goes for like a 10-yard run. So I see some of the adjustments. I mean, I, I don't think it's a Reese thing, a coordinator thing. I mean, I just think that – Again, I, I I don't know what coach can can score forty points on their own with an offensive line that that is that is clearly in developmental mode. Yeah, Mike T just commented saying Cone would be better with a good offensive line. Yeah, that, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like I, I yeah. just, you know, he he had a he, lot of success at Wisconsin. I mean, now no, he, he had a lot of success died. at Notre Dame. You know, like I think there's, I don't want to say regression, but. You know, if you look at the numbers, it's not getting better. Like he started off great against Florida State, and then this week, you know, fourteen of twenty-two, one hundred fourteen yards in the in the interception. You know, wasn't great. Here we are crowning Drew Pine. You know, as the you know the next quarterback, he was only nine of twenty-two, forty-one completion percentage, but you know did have the touchdown, and there's no doubt there was a spark there. But yeah, yeah, yeah Cone with this offensive line, just not the guy. Thing I like about Pine is. You know, when he gets the ball out so quick, Greg, does that speak to him? No, like pre snap reads, like he, um, you know, just d- does he read defenses better? You know, like, yeah. I, what's I think that's a valid is, question. He's uh, and loop in recruiting a little bit on, on this. I know that's kind of both of our backgrounds, but he, he played he, he played foot, high school football in Connecticut. Okay, we're not talking about Georgia or Florida speed. And so he comes into Notre Dame, and in his second year in the program, it looks like he is a much faster decision maker, particularly getting the ball to the outside than Jack Cohn is. So that's a credit to Drew Pine. I mean, uh, and he just got a little bit of moxie. I think he comes in. It, it's like he's not nervous. I mean, God, I would be wet in my pants if I were yeah, him. We, like, but he, I, I like him, and I wasn't big on him. I know you were. You believed in Cohn a lot, and 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 I agree with you that Cohn's not bad. I mean, I think he's just not. He's a toxic mix with with a bad offensive line. But yeah. he he. But you were a Cone guy. I was never really a big Drew Pine guy. Um, but but to me, like it's clear he needs to be the guy going forward, and he's fun to watch. There's just something about him where 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 you you like the kid and you want him to succeed. And if clearly you've gotten some evidence now the last two weeks where he gives the whole team a spark. Yeah. And I, I have been a Drew Pine guy, but I guess, you know, you can't be a, everybody, you know, I, I kind of support everybody, you know, but so I guess I can't claim too many people, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, I've been, I've been a believer in Pine. It's, it, it is funny. Um, Greg, you know, there's, you know, a lot of support now for Pine, but you know, before the season started, it's like, we don't want Ian Book 2.0 out there. That's what I would see a lot, you know, like, um, you know, he's, he's a smaller Ian Book. You're like, did you see him against Alabama? He looked tiny out there. Yeah. Like, like, look, yeah. you know, if he, if he can see over the line and, and like, if he can find throwing lanes, the kid's going to be really good. Um, and his arm strength is really improved. Um, that's something we highlighted a good bit uh, in yeah. the off season was that was the one thing I thought I'm going into that was great coming out of high school. I thought he would never have. Um, he just didn't look like a big bodied kid to me or a kid that was going to be able to generate the power on throws. And not that he's got a world beater arm, but he does. Right. He has way more pop than I thought he ever was going to have at the college level. Yeah. Without. No, there's a clip going into his senior year of him training with QB country where he 
uh, through a 50 yard ball. And he put every inch of his body into that pass. Now I think mechanically he got a little bit better. So that gives him a little bit more, um, you know, downfield velocity, but and then you saw the same kind of throw this off season going into sophomore year of college. And, you know, he's throwing 50 yards, like it's nothing. So yeah, arm strength for me is not an issue right now for, for pine. Yeah. Another point I make about the quarterback room, it's interesting because, you know, it, Tyler Buckner is another kid. I know he's from California, but he's not from modern played for modern day at California. If you know yeah. what I mean? He's a small school kid. He had the injury. What is what, he was out his junior year, right? The whole year, I want to say. And then Kobe, yeah. uh, no, uh, juice, sophomore, sophomore, year. sophomore, sophomore. And that's right. You know, he just didn't, he didn't play a lot of high school football and he also played small school football out in California. So uh, j- just making the point that you're, after Cone, you're dealing with two younger kids who, you know, this isn't Justin Fields who played for a big program in Georgia or Trevor Lawrence who played for Cartersville. Those are big programs that that play against really good high school talent. These are two kids Notre Dame has in Buckner and Pine that they're, they're, you could argue that their transition into college is is, is going to be longer. So that's, that's really what impressed me most about Pine is not just his moxie and his poise, but you know, how quickly now he can move the needle positively for Notre Dame on their offense. Yeah, I, I see your point. I don't 100% agree with it uh, because <laughs> how much football That's how much point. football Pine played. And you mentioned earlier, he owns the record of amount of rivals camps he's been to. It's like he's played against he's dudes. Really well trained. Know. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas Buckner, you know, is, is played one year at, at the quarterback position in high school. You know, like it was this junior year and it was electric. But I think he might have seen two D1 players the entire season. Probably wasn't much better for Pine. Um, but, you know, that that small ball, um, you know, football in, in, in San Diego was not very good. Yeah. Um, so I think Buckner probably would have been his team's best defensive tackle, too. You know, kind of yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I think, uh, Mike, let's get it wrapped up. You want to touch real quick about recruiting, just what you and I were up to last night, kind of preview – down the road, I know you were up in Ohio, right, seeing Brent Vernon. Yeah, yeah. Um, not a ton to talk about in terms of uh, Vernon's performance because he got double teamed all night, and I, it it was it was kind of frustrating for me to be like, man, the, you know, the, the coaching staff, I, in my opinion, wasn't doing a ton to really help him out, and I'm like selfishly trying to be like, all right, yeah, I need some sacks, Brendan, you yeah, know, yeah. but. Uh, for the sake of you know some some you know coverage interest in in the videos, but still we'll have some good stuff, um, good takeaways there. So Greg, I believe we'll have like a a video Monday where we'll yeah. talk about my travels to see um, Brendan Vernon on Friday, and you were down in Miami seeing a couple of big Notre Dame targets or recruits, I should say. Yeah, Cedric Irvin, our, the newest commitment, Irish Rising twenty three. Uh, in fact, Brendan Vernon's a, a two thousand twenty three kid as well, as well as a I saw a big target in Jalen Brown. So we'll save that for then. Uh, continue to expect blueandgold.com to cover Notre Dame football. Thank you for watching our post-game show. We're going to have a lot of recruiting coverage throughout the week. Obviously, some big topics to talk about, uh, both directly on the field and uh, out and around the football program. So make sure you're tuning in to blueandgold.com. Uh, join our community on the Loose Emoji board, um, the great Loose Emoji. And... Uh, you know, we'll have we'll, we'll we'll be back on Monday, as you said, and then back, of course, late after the Virginia Tech game. We'll have Tim Hyde back for us, by the way, uh, after that game. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to everyone for tuning in.